Hey, 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 welcome back to the energy uh, video, the energy revision videos. Uh, this one's the sixth one and it's on heat transfer. So we're still using these ideas about conservation of energy, uh, but we're applying that now to heat. Uh, this is made easier nowadays because you don't have to know about convection officially. Convection is how heat is transferred in fluids. You do need to know about radiation. Uh, but you don't we're not going to cover that until we get onto the electromagnetic spectrum so this one conduction now conduction is how heat is transferred in solids uh, we've got a nice diagram here which will explain everything to you it would be better if you go onto google and put in animation conduction words to that effect you'll get something that moves which will make this a little bit easier to understand uh, but you can see here we've got a solid and as you should really know, uh, the particles in the solid are in neat rows, uh, they're held posi in position by forces uh, and they can vibrate. They're not allowed to move or they're not able, I should say, to move from place to place. The other thing you just need to know is when you heat up something, when you heat up a particle, you give it energy. And in this case, it's kinetic energy. The particles will start to move. So if you think about this one particle here, heating that particle up will cause it to vibrate it will cause it to move left and right up and down all around eventually it will vibrate enough to bump into this particle when it does that this particle will start to vibrate it will have got some energy it will have had energy transferred to it by this particle this one will vibrate more and more and more and eventually collide with this particle. This one will start to vibrate more and more and more and so on. And so the energy, even though the flame is directly beneath this particle, the energy from the flame gets transferred along the rod. So that's why it will only really work in solids. In a liquid, for example, the particles can move. So heat in this one will mean it won't stay in this position. It will just float off up into the, uh, the, high, uh, the rest of the fluid, or it might bump into this particle. This particle will then float off elsewhere. It's not going to pass the energy on in a nice, neat pattern. It's a bit like a, a, a row of dominoes. You knock the first domino over, that knocks into the second one, that knocks into the third, and so on. You've only knocked one domino over, but by doing that, you've transferred that energy along the row of dominoes. It works best in conductor in metals. Sorry, metals are good conductors, and that's because they've got free electrons, which means their electrons or some of their electrons are able to move between these particles or ions in this case. So not only are the ions vibrating and colliding and passing their energy along, the electrons are also moving that energy along. The last part to understand about this is this idea about thermal conductivity. So thermal conductivity is just how well a material will conduct. So metals have a very high thermal conductivity. They conduct heat very easily, whereas insulators such as plastic, glass, wood are poor for conductors. They're insulators. That doesn't mean they won't conduct heat. It just means they do it less easily. If you get a, a, a glass rod and stick it into one end into the flame, the other end that you're all holding will get hot eventually. It just does it less quickly than a metal. So applying this to our homes, looking at this idea of insulation. So an insulator is a poor conductor. So to prevent our homes from losing too much heat energy and therefore w wasting energy and wasting money, we insulate them. So the speed that heat transfer depends on, depends on three things. Number one, the thickness of material, pretty straightforward. If you have a thicker material, the heat will transfer through it slower. If you've got a material that's got a lower thermal conductivity, something like wool or glass or air, it will conduct heat very slowly. And the temperature difference. So if you have a big temperature difference, the heat is transferred quicker. So if you have your house set at 30 degrees, the central heat in your house set at 30 degrees and it's zero degrees outside, that gives you a temperature difference of 30 degrees and the energy will transfer pretty quickly. If your house is set at 30 degrees but the outside temperature is 25 degrees, the difference is only 5 degrees and therefore the heat energy transfers slower. Now in terms of insulation, 
when we're insulating our homes, we're not really worrying too much about the temperature difference. That's a different thing. Tell your parents to uh, reduce the um, to reduce the central heating, and that'll save you energy, save you money. But in terms of insulation, you've got these two ideas. So we'll give a couple of examples to try and explain that. The first one is loft insulation. So loft insulation uh, are essentially really thick blankets made from a type of wool, I should say. Uh, not really wool, not from a sheet, but it's that kind of texture. And it goes into your loft. It's really thick. It's really thick and that slows down the heat transfer through the loft and into the space above, uh, into the air above your house. It's also got a low thermal conductivity. It's not made of metal. If it was made of metal, it would conduct heat really quickly and you would waste money. Cavity wall insulation. Mod most, if not all, modern houses will have actually two walls. They have an inside wall and an outside wall and a cavity, a gap, in between them. Now, that gap can be filled with air. Air is a poor thermal conductor and it means that the distance between the inside of your house and the outside of the house is really thick. It means that the heat slows down, you don't waste heat as, well, as easily. Sometimes you'll find that people will put foam inside this cavity and again, the foam has got a low thermal conductivity, it's a thick material and that will reduce the rate of heat transfer. Double glazing, exactly the same thing. Instead of having one uh, pane of glass, you have two. Two panes of glass means that the thickness, is, uh, the thickness sorry, of the window is thicker and you've also got air in between them, which is a poor thermal conductor. One last thing to talk about here is this idea about payback time. Now, it's not specifically something that will come up a lot, but you need to have an appreciation of it. Something like double glazing windows will cost a lot of money. It will also probably only save a little bit of money. So the payback time is very, very long. The cost effectiveness, therefore, is not great. Let's do a quick example. If you pay £2,000 on your double glazing and it saves you £100, which is a lot, £100 of energy every year, you've got a payback time of 20 years. Something much, much more simple, such as in loft insulation, mine only cost you uh, £150. It might only save you £15 a year, but that gives you a payback time of 10 years. So it's much more cost effective to do something like loft insulation, for example, than it is to do double glazing. The last part of this is this idea about specific heat capacity. Now, the specific heat capacity is how easily a material heats up or cools down. It's not the same as thermal conductivity. Thermal conductivity is how easily something conducts heat. This is how easily something heats up. In terms of your GCSE, the definition is the amount of energy needed to heat up one kilogram of material by one degree C. And we're given it using this formula. So energy is mass times your specific heat capacity times the temperature change. That little symbol there means change. The triangle is there. Just the only difference here is we've got Q instead of E. Still the same thing, it's energy equals mass times specific heat capacity times temperature change. That is needed because it's a core practical. You need to be able to investigate the specific heat capacity of a material. So here's the material I'm investigating. It's hooked up, or it's got a heater in the middle. The heater will be heating it up. The heater is connected to a joule meter, and the joule meter is there to work out the energy that we've supplied. We can work out the mass of the block using a balance, which is there, and we can work out the temperature change using a thermometer. So the idea is, you set this up, have the dual meter at zero, and then you switch everything on, you heat up the block for 10 minutes, and you record how much energy was supplied to the block in that time. Gives you the energy, you use a balance to work out the mass, and you use a thermometer to work out the temperature. You plug those values in, and you can work out the specific heat capacity of the material. One last thing before we finish there, I apologize if anyone could hear any screaming and shouting. I am currently looking after two monsters again by myself, and I'm just about to go and rip their heads off. Thank you.